These don't quite apply to you since you're at home watching through a screen, but I, we're trying to simulate the lab as best we can, so it's good that you get familiar with these notices that you'll see. So after each experiment, we explain the potential hazards and what you are responsible for and protecting yourself from. And so we talk about what's required. So our lab coat must be worn properly at all times, no matter what. Gloves and goggles have to be on once the experiment has started, even if it's just water and glassware. Um, water is still technically a chemical and those are the rules. Um, plus, you don't know how well the other people have washed up. Uh, the other thing too is if your group finishes before other groups are done, you still need to keep everything on while you're working on your calculations. So these are things to expect in a lab environment. You never want to remove your PPE if there's still an experiment going on. And if broken glassware happens, tell the instructor and then they'll take um, proper precautions. And then you'll also see that we don't pour any liquids over the balance, which we've already talked about, so I won't go too much into that. Okay, one last thing before we see the videos of the experiment. Um, just a reminder for your notebook, make sure you're writing in pen. Uh, you use the pages consecutively and number them, and that you're writing all the measurements directly into your notebooks. You're going to get the raw data, so make sure you fill out the data table and don't leave anything blank. Um, there are also specific shaded areas when we post the uh, data tables up for you to copy down, so make sure you know which uh, things are shaded out. So you don't get confused when there's not really a space that makes sense to fill. Uh, and then make any notes of any corrections or things we've changed based on what uh, may be in the actual document as well. And also note any observations you see too. Now, you've stuck with us for so long, so thank you for your patience. Uh, let's watch us do experiment number one. Before we get started in the experiment, I'm just going to go over the different type of glassware we have. You can see this is our glassware cabinet. So we have many different sizes of what I'm going to show you and different shapes, but I'm going to show you the basics for right now. So the most simple piece of glassware that we have is going to be a beaker. This is just standard shape here. And with all glasswares, they have the size of that glassware, but then actually the maximum graduation that they can go up to. Each line that you see is a graduation. So this is a 250 milliliter beaker and we can fill it up to 200 liters, actually measuring. This is going to be an Erlenmeyer flask. We know that because of the shape of this flask. It's kind of triangular. And this is a 125 milliliter flask and it has graduations every 25 milliliters. This is going to be a um, graduated cylinder. So it's this tall cylindrical shape. And this is something getting into analytical glassware because it has more graduations and it's generally going to be more accurate with what it's measuring. So the beaker is a little more general as far as what we measure. While you can see there's more graduations here and it's made to be more precise and more accurate as far as what we're measuring. And that's what we're going to be testing today to see which one is more true to its volume. But um, you can see this has graduations every two milliliters and it can go up to 250 milliliters. We won't use these much, but this is a volumetric flask and you don't see any graduations on it. It's a 500 milliliter volumetric flask and it only has one line right here. And the way that you fill this up is you are only to make 500, milli or 500 milliliter solutions in this. So you can't do 400 or 600, only 500. And you make sure that this line right here is a solid line when you're looking at it. So if I tilt it, you can see it kind of looks like a circle. You have to make sure both lines line up and then you can fill it to that and we're gonna talk about the meniscus later, but that's where you wanna line the meniscus up. Similar to that, we have volumetric pipettes, and they're the same exact thing. They have one measurement that they can get to. They're supposedly more accurate and precise. So if you can see, this is that one line up here, and we use a bulb to uh, activate negative pressure and pull any of our solutions up through this pipette, and then we will dispense it 
after that. So this is a 25 milliliter, but we do have smaller sizes. Lastly is going to be our burette. This is very precise. It has a lot of graduations. This goes up to 50 milliliters, but each graduation is, uh, I believe, 0.2 or 0.1 milliliters. Uh, and it depends on the glassware. So you always want to check the glassware's graduations because they will change. But the way that you dispense from this is you have what's called a stopcock and we're going to twist and turn. So when it's uh, parallel to the graduated cylinder, we'll have uh, the solution flowing. And when it's perpendicular, that means it will be stopped. Okay, so that's our glassware. And then we're gonna show you later how to actually conduct the experiment with each type of glassware. Hi everyone. Um, so I've got my PPE on. We are ready to start our experiment. Even though we're just using water, we still need to have proper PPE on because even though this is a clear liquid, there might be other chemicals in the lab that we could get harmed by. So it's important to have everything on. I'm going to start with our Erlenmeyer flask. This is a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask and I'm gonna put 100 milliliters into it. But before I do that, I need to take the mass of it while it's dry in order to determine the mass of just the water by itself. So we are gonna make sure our balance here, this is an analytical balance. It measures mass and we are gonna measure in grams today. This is not the same as a scale which measures weight. So when you're using mass and weight, they are not interchangeable. If you wanna know more about that, you can look up the difference later. So we're gonna make sure this says zero completely. If it doesn't, we can zero it out or tear it. So I'll slide the door open here, put the empty flask on and shut the door. We're gonna let it settle out for a second. And this is the value that I'm going to record in my notebook. And we're gonna record out to the fullest that we see. So the 94.430 grams. I'm only gonna show you one trial of each glassware today, but no, we are running three trials and we are going to give you that data later to work with for your calculations. Now that I've measured it empty, I can go ahead and fill this up to the target volume, which is 100 milliliters. I'm using DI water, which is, stands for deionized water. It's different than the regular tap water. So when you're in a lab, make sure you're using the proper tap water. We use deionized because there's not as many things in the water to interfere with anything during our experiments. So we're going to go ahead and pour. And as you can see, I wanna aim for this line here. I'm a little shy of it. So I'm gonna get a pipette to shoot for it. And since this is non-analytical glassware, we can't be perfectly exact, but we're gonna see how close to 100 this is. So our scale was zeroed out, and now it's got a weight of 193.490. To get the true volume, or the true mass of the water that is in this Erlenmeyer flask, we're gonna take the mass of the full beaker minus the mass of the empty beaker. So we're not involving the mass of the glass at all. So that is the Erlenmeyer flask. We're going to go ahead and do the 250 milliliter beaker next. So like I said, you always read this bigger label here, not the top label. So if you're reading it incorrectly, you'd think it's a 200 milliliter. This is a 250. I'm gonna measure empty. So let's say that I made a mistake in my book and I accidentally wrote 0.223 instead of 0.023. The way that I would correct that is not by scribbling it out. What I want to do in reality is a single strike through with my initials so someone knows that that was supposed to be scribbled out. And then I can go ahead and write the actual measurement that I needed. Once again, we are pouring 100 milliliters. 
we want to leave the beakers and everything on the table on the bench so that it is a level surface when we're pouring so you can adjust yourself or put the glass around a higher level when you're pouring in order to get the most accurate pour That's trial one for our beaker. In between trials, you're going to empty out the water and you're going to dry the glassware fully so that you can fill it again for the second trial. And then you will reweigh the new dry glassware and then fill it back up. The reason you have to do that is if you didn't do the best job of uh, drying it out, you can then measure any residual water that was left from the last trial. So that's why we have to dry in between. Next up is our 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. So this one is not quite dry, as I was saying before, but we're gonna pretend um, that we did our best to dry it and now we're taking into account these water droplets won't be counted in our original uh, measurement here. One thing you'll notice too, when I'm recording, I'm not putting the um, units on every measurement. That's because the column that I have up above in our mind table says that that is grams and that makes your tables look cleaner, clearer, easier to read. Once again, to uh, get closer to your line that you want to aim for, I'm going to make sure these two lines line up. And sometimes it's nice to use your glove or a dark piece of paper so you can see where those lines line up and where that meniscus is actually sitting. Otherwise, it's really hard to see against the white walls. going to be our 50 milliliter graduated cylinder. So same shape as the last one, just a different size. So when you're filling out your tables, you want to make sure you know what the target volume for each glassware was. So in this case, I am using a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder to fill 50 milliliters, but it, in the beginning we had a 250 milliliter beaker and we were only filling it to 100 milliliters. So in your actual table, you're going to want the target volume was 100 milliliters, not the 250 milliliter beaker. So make sure you don't get that confused. And if you can't remember, you can always go back to the procedures. Now our next two are a little bit more tricky. And I need a small beaker. So we have the uh, 50 milliliter burette right here. Uh, this is another piece of analytical glassware that is really helpful for measuring out small units of volume and also doing titrations, which we'll learn about later in the semester. But as you can see here, it's really big and it's not going to fit on the scale. So we can't measure this piece of glassware when it's empty. So the way that we can test the accuracy and precision of this is we're going to dispense it in something smaller. So this is what I'm using to carry the volume, but this is actually what we're measuring over. So I'm going to measure this empty beaker here. And now I'm going to dispense from the burette. Burettes read a little bit backwards than traditional glassware. As you can see, 
the numbers go down rather than going up. So if we look up here, we're gonna start at zero. Yeah, we're gonna start at zero right here. And then if we had dispensed from this level to this level, we've dispensed one milliliter. So you basically have to know that you are going, uh, you subtract. So you take your final and your initial volumes, which I'll show you in a little bit. So I'm gonna fill this up to zero, which you take a DI water bottle that's a squirt bottle here, and we're just gonna squirt the water until we can fill it up to this line. I don't have to get exactly at zero, but if I go any higher than zero, that's not gonna be able to be recorded. So I have to make sure I stop below zero or at zero. So what I can do is put my initial uh, volume at 0, 0.00 milliliters. We can put out so many decimal places because this is such a precise piece of glassware. And then I'm going to dispense until I hit 25 milliliters down here. And the way that I'll do that is just by opening up the stopcock here so it's parallel to the burette and then just keep an eye on the water level. Did you measure the mass of beaker? Yes, I did measure the, the okay. mass of the empty beaker and then once it's full, we'll have it and we'll be able to tell what was dispensed. This does take some time and some patience. Uh, this is how we'll do graduations later in the semester or titrations later in the semester. So you can just watch it slowly. If I want to slow the rate, I can. But we obviously want it fully open right now. So I'm just going to keep an eye until 25 liters is finished. Okay, so I'll probably cut this part out just because it does take a while and then we'll just be like, oh, it's done. Mm -hmm. So now that we have our 25 milliliters, we can weigh that. So similarly to the burette, we have the volumetric pipettes. They also cannot fit inside the um, balance, so we're gonna have to do the same thing we did and get the smaller vessel to measure. So I'm gonna measure this empty again after it's been dried out thoroughly. And we'll have that ready to fill. Now it might be hard to see while I'm doing it, but again, I'm going to fill up to this line. When I actually bend well enough, you'll be able to see that those two lines meet. So this is a 25 milliliter volumetric pipette. You can tell it's volumetric generally because of the bulb in the middle and the fact that it only has one line. There are other types of pipettes such as the disposable pipette. You can tell the difference here. So what I'm going to do is I have just some DI water. You generally want a little bit more than you need so you don't have to um, get the liquid all the way from the bottom. And then this is our bulb that we're going to use. When I scroll down with my thumb, this moves up, meaning that the solution is going to move up. And when I scroll down, it's going to push the solution back out of the pipette. So you want to make sure you're holding on to both while you're pipetting. Otherwise, these can fall out sometimes and break. Um, we want to try avoiding brickware as much as or glassware as much as we can. And then there's this rubber seal in the middle. So we're going to I hold onto the bulb here and then I just kind of shimmy it on there. Um, then we should have a good seal. So you're gonna hold on to both, have one hand on the dial, and then I'm going to fill this up 
you'll see the water rising. It does take some time. And what my goal that I'm going to do is I'm going to overshoot this line at first because I'm not at a very good angle to read that line and really know that I'm on top of it. So I'm going to overshoot, making sure not to go above this blue line because we don't want any liquid in the bulb itself because that can cause cross-contamination between experiments. I'm going to quickly remove the bulb and we will have my uh, thumb is creating suction so that the water doesn't move. And then when I'm ready, I will line myself up to make sure that that line is uh, one. And then I'm going to slowly release my thumb so that hopefully you guys can see it. That meniscus will meet the line. And once it does, I can come over and start filling up my small beaker here. And this will take some time to drain, and once it does, we can measure the mass. So just to kind of recap, we have uh, measured the mass of different volumes of some non-analytical glassware and some analytical glassware. And this is going to show us why it's important to use certain glassware when you're actually doing your experiments. Because if you have inaccurate measurements, then that's gonna mess up your whole experiment. The last thing is these will drain and it's gonna look like there's some leftover water in there. They're designed to do that. So don't bang the last little droplets out. You can damage the pipette. It has dispensed what it's supposed to without any force. So we'll go ahead and we will weigh that. And once I record this, we'll have all of our data for the experiment, and then we can move on to how we actually calculate everything. All right, so now everything is finished. We've cleaned up all our glassware, and everyone is the lab is done, so I can remove my goggles and gloves, but have to keep the lab coat on, because that's proper PPE to enter the lab in general. And now we can start our calculations. So note that I'm going to be using just the first trial. You are going to have to take an average of all three trials and then continue with this math, okay? So what we want to do in science in general is we were trying to figure out how accurate and precise this glassware is. So we are going to compare to a theoretical volume, which is that we are theoretically, we filled to 100 milliliters. We are now going to calculate the actual volume or the experimental measured practical. There's a bunch of different ways you can call it, um, but this is our actual volume that we are going to calculate. The first thing we need to do is we're going to use density to compare the two. So the equation for density is D equals M over V. D is density, M is mass, V is volume. We want to know the volume, so we're going to so solve for volume and rearrange this equation. So in order to solve for volume, we need to multiply by volume on each side, and we're going to get V times D equals M. And now we want V alone, so we're going to divide by density on each side. So it's going to be V equals M over D. That's going to get us our measured and uh, experimental volume in the lab. So we need to start with the mass in general, because right now we had the recorded masses of the glassware while it was empty and full. So I'm going to take the first trial And we want to make sure we use our units during our calculations, just so you can keep track of what you're doing. It'll help you along the way. So I'm taking the mass of the full glassware minus the mass of the empty glassware to get the mass of the H2O alone. And that's going to be 103.802 grams. This is where you're going to subtract each trial and then take an average of these masses. And you're gonna use that average where I'm using this number in the rest of the calculations. So this is M of our Erlenmeyer flask. We're gonna do these calculations multiple times um, for each type of glassware that we have. But to keep going, 
we need to know the density of the water. Density is an intensive property, so it does change based on the surrounding um, properties. So it is temperature dependent, which means the temperature of the room is going to change the density. Normally water is about one uh, gram per milliliter, but we're sitting at a room temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're gonna have to make sure where we act are actually sitting. So we are going to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius using our equation here. So uh, this is going to be 72 minus 32 times 5 ninths. So that's going to equal 40 times 5 ninths, which will ultimately equal 22.2 degrees Celsius. So we've got that as a room temperature. And if you look at the table in the lecture slides, that means that our density is 0 0.9977735 grams per milliliter. So now we can go and calculate our volume. So volume equals, and this can be volume of the Erlenmeyer flask, equals our mass 1 point, or 103.802 grams over our density. We're gonna divide these two numbers and we're going to get a volume ooh, of 104.0336309. The reason I know this is milliliters is because it's a volume, but if you didn't know, the grams will cancel out. The last thing we need to take uh, care of is we want to look back and make sure we did our significant figures correctly. So when we were subtracting, when you subtract or add, you go based off of the decimal points. So these each had three decimal points behind them. So our answer will have three decimal places behind it. Now going back down here, we had, we are dividing. So we're going to go off of significant figures, not decimal places. So our 103 has six sig figs. And this has seven because the zero in front does not count. You always want to go with the lowest amount. So we're going to round out to six significant figures. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to round up because of the six. So our volume is going to be 104.034 milliliters. This is the measured volume for the Erlenmeyer flask. And now what we're going to do is compare that to the theoretical volume, because it should have been 100 milliliters even. So the way we can do that is using a percent error calculation. And percent error is equal to the absolute value of the measured or experimental minus the theoretical all over the theoretical and that whole thing is times 100%. So we're gonna plug in our values here. So we have 104.0334, or sorry, 34, minus 100. All your units will cancel out since they're the same, which will leave you with just the percentage value here which is going to be 4.0336%. And since we have three, we are going to round to three uh, sig figs here. So we got, in this case, a percent error of 4%. And when you're doing your discussion, you wanna make sure you're reporting the values that you got. So you would say it had an average volume of 104.034 with a percent error of 4.03%. You're going to do this six times. So you're going to calculate a percent error and the volume for each glassware that we used. Make sure you know at one point, instead of 100 milliliters, it's going to change to 25. And then make sure you do a summary of the video that we, uh, the experiment you saw, as well as your calculations in your notebook, and go ahead and uh, do a discussion, talk about everything if you need.